going to put a different spin on digital transformation. So we've been talking about the technology, the technology behind digital transformation, the different, five different areas. Uh, Sanjeeva gave a great introduction and a great, great keynote. But I'm going to go into some of the areas where spatial data or location data plays a big impact or, or has a huge impact on digital transformation. So I'll be looking into some of the business areas, some of the technical areas, some of the newer business innovations, and uh, how, how this can basically provide an edge to uh, your day-to-day -day business. Right. So I've been working in the spatial domain, or the GIS domain, for some time. Uh, my uh, educational specialization is also in that area. So whilst I work at WSO2, this is also my uh, interest. So I'm, I'm basically trying to bring both those worlds together, right? But when you talk about digital transformation, you really don't hear about the location aspect, right? You don't hear about the GIS aspect, geographical information systems, mapping, so on and so forth. That's because GIS or location has become so pervasive, right? So it, it's, it's inbuilt into every part of our lives that you don't really talk about it, right? It, it's like the, the story of the, the fish in the water that Sanjeev spoke about. But location is a very important part. So, so just take examples like Uber and, and Google Maps and Google Traffic, for example. I'll, I'll, I'll be talking about this in more detail, right? But so if I need to get from, let's say, New Jersey, where I live, to New York, right? I don't go and ask a person who's been living there for 10 years, like, how's the traffic? Uh, which bus should I take? Uh, how's the traffic at this particular time? Am I going against traffic? So on and so forth, right? I just ask Google, right? So Google now has become a very reliable, very up-to-date, uh, very accurate source of information, for tra of traffic information, right? So it, it has become so ubiquitous, so pervasive, that we don't really think about it, but we always go there, right? So Uber then uses Google, uh, Google uses Waze, and there's, there's so many connections there, right? So, so there, it, you then get the whole APIs, the whole digital transformation concepts, the interfaces, so on and so forth. So that's the story I'm going to basically talk to you about today. So in the past, and when I started on whole, the, the whole GIS thing as well, uh, back in 2000s or the 90s, actually, we had to work with this thing called GRASS, which is an open source GIS system. It took like a year to really understand the interfaces of it. Uh, you had to like program stuff. You had, it's, it's really difficult, right? So we spent a year trying to just display a map on it, just, just get some data in some format from Sri Lanka and, and just display it there, right? So GIS has basically evolved a lot. So now you don't really know it's there, right? So, so in, 2000, uh, in 1969, you had S3. S3 is still the largest provider of uh, geospatial software, right? Uh, Jack Dagamond is the CEO. In 2001, Al so Algo basically gave a speech on digital earth, right? So, uh, so Algo basically spoke about digital earth, the, the importance of having a global earth model, the importance of being able to attribute an address with every single entity, the importance of basically being able to analyze these concepts using a spatial location or using some awareness, right? So, so following that, Google Earth came out. Right? Google Earth was revolutionary for lots of people. Google Maps then came out, and Google Maps was basically the baseline of making GIS really pervasive. OpenStreetMaps was another innovation. Uh, because Google Maps was all proprietary data, you, they had their own data collection mechanism. OpenStreetMaps was the Wikipedia of mapping. So they basically asked the users to map out everything. And then that basically contributed a lot of information back. And they, you had lots of organizations, like even the US government, who published a tiger data set uh, to OpenStreetMap and uh, Open Standards, right? So now you have all these mobile devices, IoT devices, sensors. Uh, you have Google Maps on your mobile, and basically when you're driving, it collects or crowdsources data and gives you quite accurate traffic information as well, right? So you had Google Maps mobile, uh, you had Waze coming up, uh, and then you basically have Google traffic, right? So, so GIS has basically evolved a lot, and I'll show you a few examples, right? Uh, I just have a few examples here. So that's the Simpsons map, right? So that's, that's a GIS again. So if you're fans of the Simpsons, right? So, so I didn't know that in Simpsons you basically had a, a Java shop as well, right? If you, so if you go search for Java, right, let's do that. 
Yeah, there's a Java server shop there, right, which will basically take you to uh, the Java server shop, right? So, so that's, that's one example of a map. Um, if you have been, if you have played with the Waz Waldo or Waz Wally games uh, in, in, when you were small, when you were young as well, uh, so the, you, you have that in a GIS model now. So uh, in 2010, people started putting up these Waz Waldo pictures on Google Earth, on, on rooftops, and then basically asking others to go and find that using Google Earth, right? So there's lots of examples. Uh, there, was, there was one of the entrepreneurs from UK, I think, who, who went on a balloon ride, those hot air balloons, and, and he, he was missing after that, right? So then the GIS community came together and shared satellite images, and they basically asked the community to help find him. So then people went around looking on the satellite images itself, and they finally managed to find where the balloon had crash landed, right? And, and they, they basically uh, helped find him as well. So there's a lot of crowdsourcing information as well uh, around that, right? So let me go back. Okay. Right, so that's, I need to switch. Okay, so, so this is basically a reference architecture for, for spatial data, right? And, and, and I'll talk about the digital transformation concepts here. So you've got on your left, uh, on your left, basically you've got crowdsourced data, you've got sensor data, right? So, so this is basically where real-time analytics plays a role. So you've got Google Maps, like so devices which runs Google Maps, which pass on uh, user data. You have uh, data coming from various social networks, from various sensors out there. So all of these data are coming in real time. And, and one of the products uh, Sanjeev spoke about is smart analytics, which basically allows you to do real-time analytics, streaming analytics on the fly. You got then imagery data sources that come through. So you got the Google satellite images. You got uh, spatial data coming from uh, like government agencies, so on and so forth. You then are able to process this data and, and do like situational awareness, alerting, so on and so forth. And you can then interface with this data, right? So you can expose data as APIs. You can expose dashboards outside, or you can do analytics on top of this. So, so it's that little green cloud there so that's where basically the GIS systems sit. So traditionally, you'll pass all this information into a massive GIS system like S3 and do some operations there. But now that's changing, right? So you expect a complex event processor, uh, which like the, the WSO2 analytics product that we have, to be able to process this data. Right? Uh, there'll be, a, I think there's a talk tomorrow on how Uber is actually using SIDI, which is the underlying technology to process data on the fly and, and do like certain fraud detections. There is a couple of demos that we have where we are using complex event processing in a financial domain where we basically can figure out whether there is financial fraud happening, right? So, so for that, we can use a location parameter and see whether a certain transaction has taken place in this particular location. And then if that transaction is successful, if there is a, another transaction happening like uh, 20 miles away, in, in basically another location. And if that is also successful, maybe you can flag it as a, a fraudulent transaction, or at least that can be part of the pattern. Right? So real time is quite important there. You should be able to integrate with existing backend systems. So integration is important there. Right? You should be able to expose these as APIs to the outside world. Right? So APIs are quite important so that you have applications like Google or applications like Uber basically consuming them and building third-party applications there, right? So, so data sources are quite important. Data sources are quite heterogeneous, right? You have different kinds of formats, and, but basically you need to be able to work with them. So, so middleware now plays a huge role in trying to process these kinds of data, right? So, so another video there on, on uh, again, on basically Google Earth. So I'll just play that for you. Hundred twenty nine thousand results. Wow. And all this time I thought Googling yourself meant the other thing. 
It's our house. But what's that thing? Oh, everyone can see you. Get inside. Never. Just put on a towel. Why don't I just put on a dress? <laughs> Homer, you've met my parents. Not naked, I haven't. All right, so that's, so that's basically, uh, so real-time data is data that comes in, right? So let me just pause that, sorry, so that we make sure we don't go into some more Simpson stuff there. Okay. Right? So, okay, so how does this tie into digital transformation? Right? So I've put three charts up, uh, Gartner's on the left, uh, S3's predictions on the right, and then some other facts in the middle. Right? So if you look at Gartner's top 10 strategic technology trends. So there is no location specifically. As I mentioned, location is a pervasive uh, entity, right? You don't mention it as, as, a, as something that really counts. But if you look at one of the things is the device mesh. So in an IoT world, you have massive number of devices all over the world. Each of these devices have a location attribute, right? It can be water sensors, it can be uh, pollution sensors that are out there. It can be actually vehicles driving around with GPS units in them. Any of these have sensors. So you need to be able to activate devices, you need to be able to monitor devices, track devices based on locations, right? So that's where this whole device mesh concept comes in. Uh, you have this concept of information of everything, right? The internet of things, which is now the internet of everything, the internet of me, everything basically has a location attribute. So we don't really realize it, but we work with location on a day in, day out basis. But location, has specific parameters, right? So it's not, it's not just a matter of doing a mathematical calculation on top of it, right? So for example, uh, so I'll, I'll talk about the transport for London use case uh, that we have as well. If you look at the extreme right, you have like the GIS trends changing the world. So location as a service has been around for some time. Uh, advanced analytics and real time analytics basically comes in, so, so we have various products for that. Mobility and IoT uh, basically plays a huge role as well, right? And location will be a part of every single thing, right? So that's, that's the base concept that uh, we're trying to talk about there, right? So I'll go into examples on the five different areas, the five different products that we have that Sanjeev spoke about in the morning, right? So first is real-time analytics or real-time stream processing, okay? Uh, so we Last year or the year before that, we put some effort into building spatial capabilities into Siddhi. So Siddhi is the underlying language for the complex event processor. So by spatial capabilities, you should be able to pass in a location parameter, which is an X and Y, and you should be able to do a radius operation and say, do certain entities or certain devices fall within this radius? Or is this device close to this device? Right? So for example, if two buses are riding along the road, uh, you should be able to compare whether these two buses are going too close to each other, uh, whether one bus is a certain distance apart so that I can now trigger uh, the driver to basically uh, start the other bus, so on and so forth, right? So we, we did a demo as well. We, we basically used data from the Transport for London. And uh, so Transport for London has a lot of open data, right? So we basically built a demo which takes the feed which is basically calling APIs from the Transport for London, passes it through the complex event processor, and shows this data in a geo dashboard, which is basically in the CEP, right? So, so if you can see this, this map basically here, what you can see there is basically the bus stops, so the red, red markers are bus stops, and the blue is really the bus moving along the road. So recently, Transport for London took this demo as well. Uh, they were quite interested in this. And uh, they took this one step further. So there was a, there was a challenge uh, from the Transport for London where they wanted like, uh, like certain scenarios carried out. So we used the complex event processor and we built a predictive model. So you can look at the bus routes, you can look at basically uh, the time of the day, the traffic of the day, and you can predict what time or what, uh, what amount of time it would take for you to get from point A to point B using a certain bus route, right? But it takes it take you a step further. So it'll tell you that if you're, going to, if you're trying to go from, let's say, New Jersey to New York, for example, or from Waterloo Station to Trafalgar Square, for example, it'll tell you 
uh, it'll basically suggest that you shouldn't leave now. Leave in another 10 minutes, and you will basically cut down your uh, transport time by 30 minutes. And you can basically use that 10 minutes to do this, this, and this. Right? So, so Google Maps doesn't do that today. Google Maps basically tells you, OK, this is the traffic. If you want to check the traffic again uh, 10 minutes later, you can check the traffic again 10 minutes later. Right? So this does all of that prediction and then basically gets back to you suggesting that you should basically leave at this time and not at the time you're trying to leave now. Right? So there, there is, there's a lot of predictive analytics that we have built in there. And there is a chance that this will be rolled out pretty soon as part of uh, the City of London uh, initiatives as well. Right? So we are today working with the City of London, the Transport for London, to integrate all of their backend systems. So they're using the API manager, they're using a little bit of the complex event processor uh, and the ESB to integrate various systems. And, and they're also looking at uh, these kinds of innovations as well, right? So that's, that's one example of stream processing use using spatial data, right? So, so we have many other examples where uh, this is being used by taxi companies. We recently did some work with the New York taxi data, which is again an open data set, and, and then basically figuring out uh, where the vehicles are, how long it's going to take, the traffic patterns, so on and so forth. So the underlying concept there is that you need an engine that can do nearly a million transactions per second in memory, real time, right? Something that can crunch numbers at a very high speed. So that's where the complex event processor plays a huge role. Second, IoT. So IoT, nearly every single IoT device has a device as, which has a location attribute uh, to it. Right? So any, any data out there that's coming in is going to have a location attribute, and you should be able to use that location attribute to control devices. So we spoke about the IoT server in the morning. So the IoT server should be able to basically say that, okay, these set of devices are in this particular location. I want to cluster these devices per their location, figure out whether there are certain clustering patterns and take action based on that, right? So for example, let's say I'm doing crowd control. I'm doing crowd control using mobile devices, right? And, and there's a couple of projects that's doing that at the moment. So basically using the mobile devices, I should be able to predict or I should be able to figure out that there's a lot of congestion in certain areas. And using that congestion clustering patterns, the telco companies should be able to increase bandwidth in those particular areas, right? So those are uh, some of the examples there. So which basically leads to ubiquitous data. So, so now we come to the, the Ubers of the world or Googles of the world. So if you have tried Google Now, if you have enabled Google Now on your phone, it basically gives you information, right? So, so just before I flew over from New York, uh, so Google's basically sent me a message saying, your flight is at this time. Uh, you should basically leave at this time if you want to reach the airport 30 minutes before check-in time, right? So, uh, so Google did that by going through my mail, picking up my flight schedule, uh, basically figuring my location out, going through traffic information, getting the real-time traffic updates, doing a prediction to figure out that this is, the, this is going to be the traffic 30 minutes from now, and then basically sending me a message. Right? So, so these, these things have basically become so pervasive, so ubiquitous, but as an underlying technology, you need a really fast analytics engine a really fast engine that can do GIS processing as well, or stream processing, in order to provide this information. And as I mentioned, uh, the Uber talk would be quite interesting because they use Siddhi, which is the underlying component, so that's, that's, an, that's a talk that will be uh, really interesting to figure out how, how, they fig uh, how they predict the vehicles, how they do the Uber pool concept, so on and so forth. So Ordnance Survey is another organization in the UK, a government entity that we worked with. So similar to like most of the government entities, uh, the UK Ordnance Survey is, is basically having, an, they basically have an initiative to release maps, open standard based maps to the community. So by releasing these maps, you can encourage participatory business models, uh, you can have third party systems based on these maps and then that'll, uh, that'll grow the number of applications and the adoption as a whole. So Ordnance Survey used the WSO2 API manager to generate and to, to basically transform maps into a standardized format and expose them outwards. Right. So in the GIS world, you already have standards called a web mapping service, a web feature service, but API manager never really played a role in the GIS world. 
So they brought in API manager, and they can now do security, uh, throttling, revenue share models, billing and monetization, so on and so forth. So this is a public API portal. If you, if you go to this link, you can actually view the APIs, view the documentation, so on and so forth, right? Similarly, integration. So integration is another key area. Uh, the example I put there is LondonWorks, which is uh, Transport for London's integration platform, where they integrate to multiple backend utility services. Right? So you've got multiple utility services like Waterworks, Roadworks, so on and so forth. So this integrates to those systems, this integrates to their GIS server, and then basically provides a, a centralized service interface for uh, consumers to consume, right? So, so that's basically integrating backend systems. Similarly, Rolta is a product uh, that's basically based on uh, the WCO2 products, specifically the ESB, which integrates to, again, their police, uh, public police services, police APIs, uh, like utility service APIs, et cetera, and provides a cloud-based view to the outside world, right? So which allows you to, uh, like to, to basically interface and integrate across the board there. And of course, identity. So identity is the area I didn't mention. So there is a lot of work we, we've been doing in a research perspective to see how spatial or location information can be integrated with SACML, for example, SACML. So if you're doing uh, an access control list, so with SACML you can say, I want this guy to have access at this particular time of day. So fine grained access control. But when you bring location in there, you can also say from at this particular time, from this particular location, right? So, so there's a location part of SACML as well, uh, which we worked on. So, so bringing it all together, so we've seen the five product strategy but all of these products or all of these components have a spatial aspect to it. So moving forward in the digital platform strategy or the, uh, like digitally transforming your enterprise, there is a location attribute which can be used to build up newer business edge cases or to basically make sense of existing data and, and uh, existing use cases. So, so start looking at spatial. As organizations, you need to start looking at the location attribute and see uh, what can what insights can be gained out of it, and this of course is being done today across multiple industries, multiple domains. For example, if you take the insurance industry, right, you have this concept of micro micro insurance now, where you basically track your vehicle, you track your driving pattern, you see whether you've been driving too fast, too slow, uh, medium, moderate pace, and then you base your insurance based on that, right. You have the finance domain, where, as I mentioned, uh, financial fraud detection based on location parameters. Right? You have the intelligence domain, of course, who does like lots of things using intelligent, uh, lots of things using location. Right? So, so with real-time stream processing combined with spatial analytics, there's a lot of opportunity out there. Right? So, for example, if you have a no-fly zone and if you need to figure out whether someone is approaching the no-fly zone, traditional GIS doesn't work. You don't want to know about that. Uh, like five minutes after the event has happened. You need to know about that, that at that point or before the event has happened. Right? So that's why it's important to use real-time stream processing. And GIS, traditional GIS was not really meant for that. So that's why middleware is important. Things like agriculture, irrigation, so on and so forth, everything's based on uh, spatial data. Right? So for example, if you need to know, uh, for, uh, let's say you have a solar panel, you're a solar panel company, you need to know where solar panels really make sense. So you need a map that shows the sunlight distribution over the year. You need to basically see where the, the solar energy is at, at the most, and then you go in and do business there. Right? So it's an intelligent business that you're doing. And then, of course, emergency management, uh, so on and so forth. So the last video for my last 51 seconds is basically on emergency management. So open street maps. So this is a project from OpenStreetMaps. You can see a timeline, and this is during the Haiti earthquake. Right? So, so what you can see there is the edits from people uh, actually happening after, I think, the 10th day. And you, then there are like millions and millions of edits happening in there. So people actually contribute uh, because this is real time. And this is an uh, open source, uh, open sharing or crowdsourced uh, API platform, or oh, sorry, mapping platform. Right? So, so what this basically proves is like compared to organizations like Google, so on and so forth, 
the whole open data, open standards, APIs play a huge role as well, right? So the minute you open up stuff, the minute you, you basically share stuff to the outside world and expect or uh, use them, sorry, let me shut that down. So the minute you basically bring in the community and have a participatory, bus participatory business model, that's when you really start digitally transforming and uh, basically coming up with newer business models. So that's basically it from me. My last slide is not loading up, so that doesn't matter. But it was a quote from uh, Algo, because Algo is the one, again, who came up with this digital earth concept, and after that, there has been a boom, right? So, so people say that it's a good thing that Algo lost the election uh, then, because then he started moving into this whole climate change and digital earth, and, and lots of things started booming then. Right? Okay, so thank you.